Well, for my part, I would like to welcome you to this annual uh, uh, Fatima Conference as the pastor of Mount St. Michael. It's always a uh, pleasure to uh, see uh, the familiar faces and also to see the new faces. And we're gathered uh, at the Fatima Conference to learn about our Catholic faith a little more and also to understand more about our Catholic, or rather about the message of Fatima, which is crucial for our times. You may be wondering about the title of this talk, Faith is the First Condition of Salvation. <clears throat> I was already asked the meaning of this phrase, and uh, I will tell you about that very shortly. Faith, as we know, is absolutely necessary for salvation. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, St. Paul tells us. So, let's see where the historical context of this, uh, of this phrase uh, is found. Faith is the first condition for salvation. We go all the way back to Pope St. Hormizdas, who reigned from... 514 to 523. And there's a famous document that was drawn up by him and referred to in subsequent centuries as the formula of Pope St. Hormizdas. You'll find it in Denzinger, which is a reference for Catholic theology. You'll find it in Numbers 171-172. So for those who want to look it up on their own, there you have it, 171, 172. What is this famous formula of Pope St. Hormizdas? I'll put his name on the board here, too, so you have that. Hormizdas. Our first safety is to guard the rule of the right faith and to deviate in no wise from the ordinances of the fathers. There's the title of my talk. Other translations of it say, our, the first condition of salvation here, this particular translation says, our first safety. So let me read it again, because this is the key idea here. Our first safety, or the first condition, is to guard the rule of the right faith and to deviate in no way from the ordinances of the fathers because we cannot pass over the statement of our Lord Jesus Christ who said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. These words which were spoken are proven by the effects of the deeds because in the apostolic see the Catholic religion has always been preserved without stain. Desiring not to be separated from this hope and faith and following the ordinances of the Fathers, we anathematize all heresies, especially the heretic Nestorius, who at one time was bishop of the city of Constantinople. And, and, and he goes on to explain about you know, the various heretics that have to be condemned because of the danger they are to the faith. And then he, in the second paragraph, he says, or rather this formula contains, we accept and approve all the letters of Blessed Leo the Pope, which he wrote regarding the Christian religion, just as we said before, following the apostolic see in all things. So again, what is the most important phrase? The first condition of salvation is to keep the rule of the faith. Now we know as Catholics that we also have to do good works. The error of Protestantism is to say faith alone, whereas we know it's faith and good works, but faith comes first. Without that faith coming first, then the good works will not happen which need to be done. So how famous is this formula of Pope St. Hermisdes, which, again, as I said, is, is offering me the title for this uh, first conference? Well, first of all, it was published to end the 
schism or schism of Acacius, one of the ones condemned in this formula. And so valuable was this formula of Pope St. Hormizdas that it was used to end another schism. This is now at, to, we'll, we'll say, to end the Phocian schism. And this, this happened at the Fourth Council of Constantinople. And this was from 869 to 870. So you see how important this document is? Those that want to be reconciled with the church are told you must sign this formula. And in the first sentence again, the first condition of salvation is to keep the faith. Okay, so it helps end, to end this schism. Over 350 years later, it's being used again. And Phocius was the, one of the, uh, the great schismatics of the East who usurped the See of Constantinople. And, and, in this fourth council of Constantinople, the, unit, the union was achieved between the east and the west. Again, unfortunately, it fell apart after this council. And never more was there an ecumenical council held in the east. But, it's, but nevertheless, it served its purpose. It was used, again, to help heal this schism. Again, this formula of Pope St. Hermisdus was so important that it was quoted at Vatican Council I. As far as I'm concerned, the only Vatican Council. And we read the exact wording again in the Constitution that talked about the infallible magisterium of the Roman Pontiff this was quoted again. The first condition of salvation is to keep the rule of the faith. And also, uh, because in this uh, constitution, the fathers were trying to, uh, or were not trying to, but actually uh, um, taught the infallibility of the Roman pontiff in his teaching office. And notice again these important words in the apostolic see the Catholic religion has always been preserved without stain. In other words, the apostolic see cannot lead the faithful astray. The apostolic see cannot be an instrument of heresy. And so therefore, there's a, there, there, was, uh, there arose this axiom uh, from the earliest centuries of the church, Roma locuta causa finita. Roma locuta causa finita. Rome has spoken, the matter is settled. Or there's an end of discussion. Why? Because the apostolic see is the infallible guide for us. Because faith is so critical for our salvation. If we don't have the right faith, if we believe the wrong things, we're not going to save our souls. So therefore, our Lord gave us an infallible guide in order so that we may keep, again, first sentence, the faith. The rule of faith, which is the first condition or the first safety. You know, it's interesting, the Latin says the prima salus. And it's been translated variously as first condition or first safety. But it, again, it gets across the idea that's the number one thing that matters in, or, in chronological order. You'd have to have the faith so that you may save your soul. Now, this explains uh, somewhat simply why many a traditional Catholic does not regard the hierarchy 
in Rome as possessing the Catholic faith. Why we do not adhere to Rome? Because Rome today is not teaching the truth, is not teaching the faith, is leading people astray. We can't apply this axiom, Roma locuta causa finita, to the Vatican II hierarchy. Now let me read to you a little bit of a lengthy quote, but it, and I don't even know the author of this, but you could find this in many uh, uh, a book on the Catholic faith, and it it uh, it's even though it's generic, it uh, it conv- gets across the point very well. Christ came down from heaven to teach us the truth. This is why I was born and why I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth said our Lord in John chapter 18, verse 37. The truths that Christ came to teach us were set forth by our blessed Lord, not as just so many theories, but as absolute realities. Not as poetic productions spun from the human mind, but as actual revelations of an all-wise, all-truthful God. And as such, impose on men the obligation of accepting and believing them. He who does not believe, said our Lord, shall be condemned. Christ was uncompromising in his doctrinal teachings. He tolerated no hesitant or half-hearted assent. On one occasion, he let a goodly number of his disciples depart from him because they found his words hard to bear and would not consent to them. It was incumbent on Christ, therefore, to provide a means whereby his teachings should be transmitted in their integrity to all men until time should merge into eternity. This our blessed Lord did in a very definite manner when just before his ascension into heaven, he set up his church and gave to that church a standing commission, bidding her to go forth into the whole world to teach in his name and with infallible authority, saying, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. And right there we have our theme for this year's Fatima Conference. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. All power, all nations, all things, all days. The church of Christ then is and must ever be, as as St. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.15, the pillar and mainstay of the truth. It's also been translated as the pillar and the ground of truth. That's an important verse to remember. I would jot that down in case you're ever discussing matters with a Protestant who says the Bible is the sole rule of faith. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It says in 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is the pillar and the ground or mainstay of truth. The church is the pillar and the mainstay of the truth. Continuing from this quote, a church that cannot give me religious certainty is certainly no church for me. No church that is fallible can be the church of the infallible Christ. To contend that the spirit of truth is with every conflicting church and that God is teaching contrary doctrines and irreconcilable creeds is nothing short of blasphemy. By the very terms of its institution, the church of Christ must be an infallible church. He who hears you, as our Lord said, hears me. And then that's Luke chapter 10, verse 16. Don't you feel good now, my dear brethren? (laughs) You and I belong to an infallible church. We don't have any fear. We can't have any fear of being led astray by the true church. Again, Roma locuta, causa finita. Again, Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 3.15. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. As long as we stay close to the church, adhere to the church, we will infallibly know what we need to do to save our souls. Let's go now and discuss a little bit about faith. 
After all, we said faith is the first condition for salvation. And we again, we got this from this for, famous formula of Pope St. Hermisdas. What is faith? Faith in a general sense is believing someone else's word. And actually, there's such a thing as human faith. If you told me you had steak and eggs for breakfast today, I'd believe you. But since you didn't have steak and eggs for breakfast this morning, I don't think anybody would, any of you would tell me you had it. But I would tend to believe you. That's human faith. If, and if I told you that I did something this morning, you would tend to believe me. Matter of fact, priests are held to a very high standard of truth. I've been told more than once that oh, priests would never lie to me. Let's hope that's all. Let's hope that's true. Okay, so let's delve into this ver- this all important word, faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We better know what it means. In a technical and supernatural sense, faith is adhesion of the intellect under the influence of grace to a truth revealed by God, not, account, not on account of its intrinsic evidence, but on account of the authority of him who has revealed it. St. Paul defines faith in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it is the substance of things to be hoped for the evidence of things that appear not. Now, let me explain about intrinsic and extrinsic evidence. If you and I were shown on paper that 2 plus 2 equals 4, we would assent to that. Why? Because, it make, because we understand it. 2 plus 2 is 4. That's intrinsic evidence when we ourselves understand it. But let's say one of you is a rocket scientist. And you tell me this complex formula for, you know, the trajectory of a rocket when it goes into orbit. And this formula is, or this equation is this long. Now, after you tell me it, I'm not going to understand it. The intrinsic evidence is not there for me. But I would believe you because you're a rocket scientist and you're telling me that this equation is what has to be satisfied for that rocket to get into the proper orbit. That's extrinsic evidence. If it's, if I look at the, if I study really hard and among my duties here at this pastor at Mount St. Michael and become a rocket scientist, and finally, I understand that formula, then it becomes intrinsically evident to me. But as matters go, you won't see me anytime soon studying rocket science. I'll, I'll leave that to others. So this is what faith is. We accept what God teaches us in Revelation, not because we understand everything, intrinsic evidence, but because of the extrinsic evidence that God told us so. That's faith. And you know what? Because we have to accept things we don't fully understand, there's a great deal of merit. It's the merit of faith. When you are told, when I am told, that there are three persons and yet only one God, We don't have to understand that. We never will be able to understand that fully. But God has revealed that to us. And so we say, with humility and meritoriously, I believe. That's the first condition of salvation. You must believe the necessary things that God wants us to know. Um, 
let me just read a little bit more. It sounds a little technical, and, and but I think it's illustrative of this point. Faith is formally in the intellect as a habit, one of the three theological virtues infused by God, but it is also there as an act. In the act of faith, the will also concurs because the divine truths often surpassing the rational capacity of man lack that evidence which usually determines the ascent of the intellect. Therefore, the intervention of the will is necessary in order to move the intellect to adhere to the revealed truth, although incomprehensible, out of homage to God. So, so the beauty of baptism is when, when a little baby is baptized, even though that baby cannot exercise his will. By the gift of God, faith is infused into that baby's soul. And that happens at every baptism. That comes along with sanctifying grace, the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, the everlasting character or the eternal character that will be there, um, or the last, uh, the uh, indelible character. That would be a better way to describe it. All of that happens at baptism. But when the baby grows up and starts to use his intellect and will he he makes now not it doesn't just have the habit of faith but it's the act of faith that is made and it's the will that says all right understanding even though you don't completely grasp this i'm going to make you say i believe so our intellect and understanding have that interplay between them and the act of faith which we make. Again, all important for salvation, and this is meritorious, this is pleasing to God when we say, I don't completely understand, but I do believe. Isn't it true also when you see, when you read the Gospels, isn't it what our Lord came to seek from everybody? Do you believe? Do you believe me when I say I am God? I am the Savior? Do you believe my doctrines? Do you believe my teachings? Remember that time the centurion came and, and asked for his servant to be healed and our Lord says, I will come. And he says, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Say but the word, and my servant shall be healed. And then our Lord says, He marveled. That's what the Gospel says. He marveled at the faith and says, I have not seen such great faith in Israel. All right, I won't come. Your servant is healed because of your faith. Faith doesn't come easily to our prideful, fallen human nature. We'd rather say, I want the intrinsic evidence. I want to understand it for myself. And if I don't, I'm not accepting it. Grave sin of pride. Sin of heresy. We have to humbly accept. And God is pleased every time. We say, I believe. Isn't it interesting also in Luke, and I forget which exactly where, our Lord says, Think you when the Son of Man comes again on the earth, will, or comes again, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, it's going to be, apparently be so difficult for people to make that act of faith that our Lord is going to have to search for it. It seems from that one verse there we see, in St. Luke's Gospel. Faith, both in its beginning and its successive development, is always the effect of the grace of God. Whenever you say, I believe, that is the gift of God that came to you. And fortunately, you accepted that gift of God. And you say, I believe. Luther reduces faith to a blind trust or confidence in the divine mercy, the modernist to a sentiment erupting from the subconscious. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. We're going to see how destructive that is, especially modernism. And I'm not going to steal Father Benedict Hughes' thunder because he's going to give you a talk on modernism. But at least I can briefly allude to that, how important or rather how devastating modernism is to faith.
But let me also give you one other simple uh, explanation of faith. And I was just speaking with our uh, keynote speaker, Mr. John Lane, yesterday. Uh, and just started trading a couple of ideas. And uh, he pointed out that there's a very simple way of looking at, at faith and charity. Faith and charity, he says, are the two means that we go to God. By faith, we know what we need to do, and by love, we do it. And you need to have both. And I thought that was just a, a wonderful way to condense it into a, a powerful yet simple form. And this is why faith is so important, because if we don't know what we're supposed to do in regards to our salvation, if we don't know about God from faith, then how can we love Him as a, as a Father? How can we love the other aspects of God which are so beautifully illustrated in the Gospels, in the Epistles, in the other writings of Scripture? So you see, by faith we know, and by charity then we do what, uh, what faith is shows us we need to do. As I said, I want to at least briefly touch on modernism and how it attacks the faith. And, you know, it's interesting that in psychology, this idea of the subconscious arose, well, probably well over well over a hundred years ago. And this was, and this is, I'm reading from a dogmatic text here. And this is uh, just an explanation of what is meant by subconsciousness. Uh, this was a term brought into current use by Myers, who believed he discovered in 1886, outside the periphery of human consciousness, a psychological substratum, vague and obscure in itself, but rich in perceptive and emotive resources, which he called precisely subconsciousness. Of course, Freud took it to a whole other level, the subconsciousness. William James adopted the theory and applied it to religious experience. According to these authors, a conscious ego exists in us, clear and normal, which is our ordinary personality. But in the depths of our mind, there is hidden a subconscious ego, also called subliminal, in which are elaborated intuitions and vague sentiments unknown to us, but which gradually group themselves merge and suddenly erupt into the zone of the conscious ego, where they determine new aspirations, new directive ideas, and new life. Um, in the obscure subliminal consciousness is, elab is elaborated, especially the sentiment of the divine, which is the root and source of religion. That is the key, one of the key heresies and falsehoods of our time. That religion comes from the subconscious and gradually works its way into your conscious level, and that's what religion is. That's false. Religion is revealed by God. Faith cometh by hearing. St. Paul tells us, faith does not come from the subconscious. <laughs> the true religion doesn't come from that. And you'll notice in, in, the, in the, all the ramblings of the Novus Ordo Church, their frame of reference is that religion is this feeling that wells up from, in, from the subconscious. Pope St. Pius X clearly condemned it in Pashendi. He says that is the modernist teaching. Faith cometh this way. Be good to point to people's ears. Faith cometh this way. It doesn't come this way. Hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ. The, the commentary from the dogmatic text concludes, this theory that religion comes from the subconscious has passed into modernism, upsetting the concept of revelation of the church and of the whole Christian religion. No wonder Pope St. Pius X called modernism the synthesis of all 
heresy. Roll all the heresies of the centuries into one and you have modernism. Because it attacks the entire notion of revelation. Anyway, I don't want to take away from Father Benedict's <laughs> talk. I'm sure he's going to delve into this uh, deeply. I want to uh, now make a reference to Benedict XVI and his modernism. It's very clear that that he believes this. I mean, look at what happened in uh, in, in, in the uh, the big controversy that erupted over his comments on Islam, and he made it. He made it a point to apologize afterwards and to say, I have great respect for Islam. Now, what does that tell us? Is Islam revealed by God? So why would he be respecting it as a religion? Because, to him, religion wells up from the subconscious. And therefore, we have to respect it. And, that's, and that heresy is right from Vatican Council II. When we see the praising of the false religions going on in the documents of Vatican II. I won't go into that right now, or rather at all. I, I believe it will be covered in other talks. It's been covered in other conferences, many other presentations. Again, religion comes from God, from divine revelation. There's nothing, there's nothing from divine revelation in the non-Catholic religions of the world. They're not from God. But anyway, I wanted to uh, make reference to Dr. Droleski's uh, um, commentary on on something that uh, Benedict XVI wrote in 1987. The Principles of Catholic Theology was the name of this book. But it shows how influenced by modernism he is in his thinking. And I'm reading now from this book, and this is from Dr. Droleski's commentary of August 21st. The old problem of being in time, which the Eleatic school and later Plato and Aristotle solved almost exclusively in favor of being, raises its head anew. The decisive turning point lies with Hegel. Now, Hegel was not a Catholic philosopher. And he's saying, now we're going to have a new understanding of the truth because of this German philosopher, as far as I'm concerned, paved the way to, to communism and Nazism in his teachings. But anyway, he says, we have a new turning point here with Hegel, since which being and time have been more and more intertwined in philosophical thinking. Now, and he says, you get two schools of thought from Hegel, and, he, and one of them is... Um, well, he calls them the opposing position, opposing positions. One of them is Marxism, and I don't think he's going to say he's going to be a Marxist, so he probably sees good points in the other point of view, all again because of this new, uh, new point we found in Hegelian philosophy. Um, in such a view of the self-evolution of the Logos, both the Catholic and the Protestant interpretations of Christianity have meaning, each in its own way, they are true in their historical moment. But they can remain true only by being abandoned when their hour has come and assimilated into the newly developing whole. Truth becomes a function of time. The true is not that which is true, for truth is not simply that which is. It is true for a time because it is part of the becoming of truth which is by becoming. Did you understand that? <laughs> this means that of their very nature, the contours between true and untrue are less sharply defined. It means above all that man's basic attitude towards reality and towards himself must be altered. In such a view, which he doesn't say he renounces, by the way, fidelity to yesterday's truth consists precisely in abandoning it 
in assimilating it into today's truth. Did you hear that? He's saying that truth has to be understood in its historical context. And you have to abandon that in order to see how it fits into today's context. And he says what we're doing is we're preserving that truth but in a new context. This, this explanation of his has shown up in some of his declarations since um, uh, assuming as, he, as it's presumed uh, his, his, the Sea of Peter. So he says, what he's saying is the truth is contextual. So therefore, if Pope St. Pius X found it important to condemn modernism in 1910... That was, the, that was the historical context of the time. We're now in, that, in the 1960s. We have a whole new set of historical circumstances, a new context, and therefore there's a new way now of understanding the truth. This is pure modernism, and it is destructive of the faith. Because... Essentially, what he's saying at a deep level here is the truth changes with the times. And we reject that. We have to reject that. Christ the same today, yesterday, and always. Scripture tells us the truth does not change with the times. But anyway, one last quote here, as Dr. Droleski pointed out, and this is the last sentence of that extract. The question of hermeneutics is, in the last analysis, the ontological one, the question of the oneness of truth in the multiplicity of its historical manifestations. You see, he can't get away from that. He has to keep saying, if you don't understand the history of it, you're not going to understand the truth of it. That's false. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of, of Christ's teaching is that whether it was in the 1st century, the 5th century, the 10th century, the 19th century, or 2006, it's the same. We don't need to be students of history to know what the truth is in any one of those points. We just have to have faith. And faith cometh by hearing. And we say, I believe. Because faith is so important, the church punishes her children who deviate from the faith as a good mother. I want to now talk to you about how the church looks after her children in that way. And it's based, of course, on the divine law. One, one important uh, quote to remember, which is very authoritative, well, all of Scripture is authoritative, but... Mark 16:16. 16, 16. That's pretty easy to 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 remember. I'm, I'm sorry the the ink is starting to fade here. I believe we're going to get another <laughs> pen here. Anyway, in Mark 16:16, 16, 16, our Lord says, "This is just before He's ascending into heaven. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned." Seemingly harsh words. But what our Lord is saying is that's how important the faith is. You cannot say, I'm not going to believe what God says. Get, to get back to our simple explanation, if we don't know about God, how can we love Him? You can't love what you don't know. So that's why faith is so important. First condition of salvation. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. That's, that's our Lord's very own words. This is why the missionaries risked life and limb and freedom and also made all kinds of sacrifices to bring the faith to far-reaching parts of the world. How are these people going to know the gospel unless it be preached to them? Missionaries have to be sent. Faith cometh by hearing. So, getting back to Holy Mother Church, let's look at her canon law here regarding 
regarding faith and see how how strongly the church guards faith. Canon 1325, number 2. One who after baptism, while remaining nominally a Christian, pertinaciously denies or doubts any one of the truths which must be believed, a fide divina et catholica, is a heretic. If he falls away entirely from the Christian faith, he is an apostate. Finally, if he rejects if he rejects the authority of the Supreme Pontiff or refuses communion with the members of the church who are subject to him, he is a schismatic. So, pertinaciously. Would you believe me if I told you I have a new marker? <laughs> now you have the intrinsic evidence. It's right there. You see it with your own eyes. All right. Pertinacious. That's a key word there. And it means knowingly. To put it, to put it a little more simple, uh, or in other words, we would say a material, uh, a material heretic, which doesn't involve a crime, material heretic is one who doesn't know any better. A formal heretic, and this is the this is the 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 penalized uh, uh, situation or where the penalty comes into play. A formal heretic is one who knows better. So, to illustrate, if uh, if we have a uh, uh, a seven-year-old who's preparing for First Communion who says, uh, you know, in God there are four persons. We'd say, my dear child, <laughs> you're a material heretic. <laughs> That's wrong. Go learn your catechism a little better. It's three persons. Oh, I okay, I understand. Three persons in one God. We don't impute the sin or the crime of heresy to somebody who doesn't know any better. But let's say we have a theologian. Uh, if we have a theologian, say from the from a pulpit or from a or from a a, teach, a chair of a of teaching, there are four persons in one God, or there are three gods, or Mary was 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 not is not immaculately conceived. What are we? Oh my goodness, we're getting pens. Oh, thank you, sister. Oh, ye of little faith, <laughs> just have to believe, and all sorts of pens will appear. <laughs> I might even get more. <laughs> anyway, so you see the difference there. The formal heretic is one who knows, and he says, I don't accept it. The material heretic is just still in the process of learning. It's not imputable to that person. So, now the penalties. All, this is now Canon 2314. Number one, all apostates from the Christian faith and all heretics, heretics and schismatics are ipso facto excommunicated. By that very fact. You know, unless that heretical theologian is sleepwalking or, or doing something like that, when he says, you know, Christ is not God, the resurrection didn't happen, Christ is not present in the Holy Eucharist? That's pertinacious. That person is by that very fact excommunicated. That's the law of the church. If after due warning they fail to amend, they are to be deprived of any benefice, dignity, pension, office, or other position which they may have in the church. 
They are to be declared infamous, and clerics, after a repetition of the warning, are to be deposed. I think we have to remember this because there's a erroneous thinking among in some circles that if somebody hasn't been declared to be a heretic that he can't be a heretic oh no did you hear those words ipso facto by the very fact again faith, faith is the first condition for salvation if we can with impunity deny essential teachings of the church where does that put us? Where does it put the church? What happens to the unity of faith? So you see the church builds in into some crimes an inherent punishment for the good of that person and for the good of the, whole, the church as a whole. You cannot deny a doctrine of the faith and still say, I am a Catholic. You leave the church. You're cut off from the church by denying even one dogma, one, one teaching of Christ, one, one teaching of divine and Catholic faith. And it, it mystifies me that people can look at you know, the modern church and say they're all Catholic simply because nobody's declared anybody to be a heretic. No. There's an inherent penalty. Pope, Saint Pi, or not, Pope Pius XII mentioned that in, in I believe, Mystici Corpus Christi. He says, Not all crimes sever one from the church, as do heresy, apostasy, and schism. And then the church also says, One is suspected of heresy who, after warning, fails to remove the cause of suspicion. He shall be barred from legitimate acts. And if he is a cleric, he shall moreover, after a repetition of the warning as proof fruitless, be suspended ad divinis. So, yes, the church does as a mother still warn these people, even if they are ipso facto excommunicated. The church wants to bring them back. And as soon as they repent, they're to be absolved. Excommunication is always a medicinal penalty. It's not a vindictive penalty. Medicinal. It's there for healing. And as soon as the person is repentant, that sentence is according to the mind and law of the church to be lifted in the, in the appropriate way, either in the internal form or the external form, depending on where the crime happened. Now, this is also, l listen to this, see how it applies to the, the, the modern hierarchy. This is Canon 2316. One who spontaneously and with full knowledge helps in any way the propagation of heresy or who cooperates in divinis, or in divine services, with heretics contrary to the provision of Canon 1258, is suspected of heresy. What is the modern hierarchy doing but worshipping with non-Catholic religions on a regular basis? Aiding and abetting heresy on a regular basis. They're on this, really on the same level as us. Look how we all get together in these ecumenical fellowships. How can one escape the crime, the charge of heresy in doing that? Let's now listen to Pope Leo XIII and Satis Cognitum. This is, again, explaining how strongly the church guards the faith. The faith is the first condition for salvation, and therefore we have to put strong walls around it. Whatsoever he commands, this is Pope Leo XIII, this is written in 1896, whatsoever he commands, he commands by the same authority. He requires the assent of the mind to all truths without exception. It was thus the duty of all who heard Jesus Christ, if they wished for eternal salvation, not merely to accept his doctrine as a whole, but to assent with their entire mind to all and lawful to withhold faith from God, even in regard to one single point. It only makes sense. I mean, if you... If you say to Jesus Christ, I'm not, I don't accept this one doctrine, you may as well not accept any of his others. 
because the basis for accepting them is the same for all of them. He's God. He's telling us. So how can we say this one but not that one? Continuing from Satis Cognitum. The church founded on these principles and mindful of her office has done nothing with greater zeal and endeavor than she has displayed in guarding the integrity of the faith. Hence she regarded as rebels and expelled from the ranks of her children all who held beliefs on any point of doctrine different from her own. The Arians, the Montanists, the Novatians, the Quartodecimans, the Eutychians did not certainly reject all Catholic doctrine, they abandon only a certain portion of it. Still, who does not know that they were declared heretics and banished from the bosom of the church? In like manner were condemned all authors of heretical tenets who followed them in subsequent ages. And then he quotes St. Augustine, I believe, there can be nothing more dangerous than those heretics who admit nearly the whole cycle of doctrine, and yet by one word, as with a drop of poison, infect the real and simple faith taught by our Lord and handed down by apostolic tradition. The practice of the church has always been the same as is shown by the unanimous teaching of the fathers, who were wont to hold as outside Catholic communion and alien to the church, whoever would recede in the least degree from any point of doctrine proposed by her authoritative magisterium. St. Augustine notes that other heresies may spring up to a single one of which, should anyone give his assent, is by the very fact cut off from Catholic unity. No one who merely disbelieves in all these heresies can for that reason regard himself as a Catholic or call himself one. If he, if he holds to any single one of these, he is not a Catholic. That's St. Augustine, quoted by Pope Leo XIII. That's how important the faith is. Now, a little caveat here. Even though somebody may ipso facto excommunicate himself by denying something of divine and Catholic faith, it does not give us all an individual jurisdiction to pronounce sentence of excommunication. I think we have to remember our place. Unless we are endowed with the ordinary, ordinary jurisdiction, we cannot make a... Uh, make what we call a jurisdictional decision here. However, we certainly can and must separate ourselves. You see? You see the difference? We're not making a jurisdictional act, but when we realize that somebody is ipso facto cutting himself off, we don't say, oh, wait, please, <laughs> Let me stay with you. There are consequences to that. We pray for their repentance. And this is why as traditional Catholics we do well, as we are doing, to separate ourselves from this modern church, which is riddled with heresy. As a matter of fact, there's so much heresy going on since Vatican II, there's a phrase that has come up in recent years called cafeteria Catholicism. It's like, you know, going out to eat. I'll have a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I don't like that. And talk to your average Novus Ordo Catholic and you will find him subscribing to heresies you will find this person saying, and I'm going to give you some statistics here shortly, I don't believe in that teaching. I don't believe in that. I don't follow that. That person has cut himself off from the unity of the church, the unity of faith. The church stays together. That's its first mark the unity of faith 
everybody believes the same set of doctrines. In April 1994, the New York Times CBS News poll interviewed various Novus Ordo Catholics and found that 70% of those between the ages of 18 and 44 said that the Eucharist was just a symbolic reminder of Christ. Those 45 to 64 years old, only 58% 58 of them said he's only symbolically present. And even those in the 65 and up group said, of 45% of them, said that he's only symbolically present in the Eucharist. They've denied the real presence. As Father Chicada wrote in his blue book welcome, booklet, Welcome to the Traditional Mass, in past ages, Catholic martyrs chose to die rather than say that Christ's presence in the Eucharist was nothing more than a symbolic reminder. Now the average quote, Catholics' beliefs about the Eucharist are indistinguishable from that of a Lutheran, a Presbyterian, or a Methodist. You heard those statistics. Whoever says Christ is not present in the Eucharist has cut himself off from the faith. I don't think we can say, oh, they're just material heretics. They don't know any better. They are reasonable, thinking people. It's hard to see how they would not cut themselves off from the faith. You know, there's a story from the life of St. Jane Frances de Chantal. whose feast day is August 21st. When she was a girl, a Calvinist came over to visit their home and was arguing with her father and I believe even with her about the, I think, uh, about the Catholic faith. I, if I'm not mistaken, it was about the Holy Eucharist in, specifically. And he says, I don't believe Christ is there in the Eucharist. It's just a symbol. And she was arguing with him as a little girl. And then to pacify her, he gave her a little piece of candy. That don't let, little girl, just take it easy. You know what she did with that piece of candy? She went over to the fireplace and threw it into the fire and says, that's what's going to happen to anybody who says that Jesus is not present in the Holy Eucharist. That's a saint. It's in the Roman breviary. And it's true. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. You know, if you want to find the faith, you'll find it. I I don't have time in this talk, but last year when we had that seminarian from Russia, he found the Catholic faith in atheist communist Moscow and was baptized. He was looking for the faith, and he found it. If you're looking for faith, if you want to believe, you'll find it. It's a gift that God gives. Seventy percent of modern Catholics deny the church's teachings on an official birth control. That's condemned in Scripture. They deny the resurrection of our Lord, many of them. Oh, it doesn't really matter if he really rose from the dead. It just matters how you believe, how you feel about it. Fifty percent or more want women ordained. I mean, these are all denials of dogma. So, what has happened? The wolves have entered into the fold and have devoured the sheep. Are killing them killing their faith, and without faith they cannot please God. And they cannot love God and serve Him as as, as they need to. As Scripture says, My people are perishing for lack of instruction. So, I remember then, my dear brethren, unity, the church is one. The church is united in faith. It is united in worship. 
and in normal times is united in government. Right now we don't, we have a difficulty in that regard. But at least we can say that we have the unity of faith and unity of worship and even the unity of government so far as traditional Catholics follow for the most part the same set of laws. And in our Lord's good time, He will restore the hierarchy as He sees fit. But regardless of how what happens, how He restores it, what He does, let us not forget His words. I will be with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. Let us have a strong, humble, and willing faith. Let us pray like the man did in the Scriptures who wanted his son healed. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Let's keep believing and growing in that faith. God bless you.